everybody. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about interstellar biology. Now it's a very particular approach to interstellar biology. Uh, just to clear a few things up, I'm not going to talk about the search for extraterrestrial life. And I'm also not going to talk about spreading life through the universe. It's, uh, it's a bit of a different take, but it'll, it'll become clear during the talk. Um, I've basically split up my talk in three parts. Uh, the first part is going to be a bit of an introduction on my own background. Uh, I'm quite new to this scene. It's actually my first uh, talk at any Starship meetup, any Starship Congress. So I'm quite excited about this. So that's why I wanted to provide you with a bit of background of the different things that I've been doing in the past that led me to work in the field of Starship, starship design. Uh, secondly, I'm going to propose to you my, uh, the concept that we've been developing with a team, the D-STAR team at Delft University of Technology. It's a particular concept um, for a bio-inspired starship. And then last but not least, I'll go into a little more of the results, uh, mostly the modeling, uh, the, concept, the concepts behind the modeling uh, that we're developing. I usually start my talks with this uh, particular slide. Um, I'm actually a biologist, I'm a developmental biologist and an ecologist. And my first research, well, my first PhD, was on deformities of the teeth of larvae of non-biting midges. So I spent many years researching that particular part of reality, looking at the world through a microscope. Very interesting, um, because the larvae of these, um, of these insects basically live in sediments of streams and rivers, and when there is environmental pollution, their teeth start to deform. So you can use the deformities as bio-indicators of environmental stress. So it makes, it makes more sense than it's... Uh, at first sounds like. Um, but nevertheless, I was really wondering if this would be the rest of my career. And I was always interested in the arts since I was a, a, teen, a, a kid, basically. I was always interested in both art and science. And during my, uh, my studies, I also enrolled in art school and I studied photography. And that's where my, I became really fascinated by the arts. And I'm glad that uh, uh, at the beginning of the conference, Andreas brought up the importance of the arts because I am going to talk uh, some, uh, a little bit about arts uh, today. So anyhow, I was doing my research in biology. I was also studying photography. When it all was done, I really felt like I'm going to become a full-time artist. You know, science is interesting, but you know, I will be, in the end, my life will be all about art. And I started creating art in which I was in incorporating, integrating my biology background. This is a, a, the project that we've uh, been running for 10 years. I'm actually operating from within a collective. I'm not uh, working as an individual artist any longer. And the project is called Biomod. And the Biomod project is a, um, just to give you an example of, of how you can translate biology, science, and technology, and you can, you, can, you can translate it into art, and you can create hybrid art. Um, what we do in this particular project is we show people all over the world how to recycle e-waste, old computers that people throw away. Uh, we take them apart, we check all the components, and then we start building functioning computer units with that e-waste, and we connect them together into a sculptural unit. And then, crucially for Biomod, we build living ecosystems inside the computers that use the waste heat of the electronics to grow and develop. So we create these really hybrid installations that still operate. And then the, the network that runs on this system is used for multiplayer computer games. They're not regular commercial games, they're art games. So whenever people visit the artwork, they actually heat up the system. They boost the growth of the internal ecosystem. And so social gathering gets translated into biological growth through technology. So there's a lot of poetics there, which is crucial in this project. It's also the first art project in which I decided to, um, to work with communities. Many artists were start out working individually, um, but I got really interested in the concept of co-creation. Uh, bringing a concept to a group of people or gathering a group of people around a concept and then through group dynamics shaping the project. This is very different than traditional top-down design where there is you know, a few leaders that are you know, building the, making the plans and then people execute. This is very different. This is a co-creation approach. This version, by the way, that I'm showing here was, done, was created last year at the National Taiwan Museum of Fine Arts with a group of 100 people. So we built these projects without a plan where everybody is empowered to contribute. So you can imagine the kind of chaos that it sometimes generates, but that's how I thrive in that. Um, this is an example of how we connect this idea of recycling waste heat and growing biology. What you can see here, let me see if I can, whoops. What was that? If I can find the pointer, yeah. 
what you can see here is a motherboard that is being cooled using water cooling. It's a very efficient way of cooling. I think most people of you will know this. But instead of using commercial coolant liquid, we use living algae, a culture of living algae to cool the computer. So the algae culture grows better because of the heat of the computer, and the computer works because of the algae. So it's symbiosis between a motherboard and a single cell. This is kind of interesting things that we do. We push things further, and we started getting interested not just in a kind of passive way of computer systems taking care of ecosystems, um, and then we basically got interested in, in, in using sensors and robotics. So basically the, the computers or the artificial intelligence running on the network would start to actively take care of the ecosystem. What you can see here is a robotic system that was developed by uh, students, design students in New York. It was a larger community project, again, another biomod a few years ago. And um, this remote operated car was basically hacked, connected to the computer game, and then the game could position the car above a specific plant and would then squeeze a wet sponge above the plant. So you could really see how the AI was trying to physically take care of the ecosystem. Like I said, I'm operating uh, from within a collective. We, lo we started after doing these kind of projects for 10 years. We were with so many people uh, key that, that kept on collaborating and working together, we decided to become a collective. And our, the name is Space Ecologies Art and Design. That's our name. And right now we've been doing projects in all these places or we're currently active uh, in these places with different projects. Biomod is just one project. Now the goal of the collective is not just to focus on art, we're also doing research. And so the research that I'm presenting today is also part of this, uh, of this story. Now how did this lead me to the work that I'm pr gonna present here? Well, while I was building these systems, they look quite futuristic, right? And I basically got contacted by the European Space Agency, by the MELISSA program. And that's something I'm going to talk about in much more detail uh, this morning. The MELISSA program is a regenerative ecosystem that is designed by the European Space Agency for future space colonization. It's basically an ecosystem that recycles all human waste and turns it back into food that provides also the oxygen for the astronauts. I immediately got really interested in this invitation. First of all, I'm a biologist. Secondly, I love space exploration. So I started working with them. First as an artist, but slowly more and more as a researcher. Here is a little bit of more information about the Melissa program. It's actually an acronym for Microecological Life Support System Alternative. It was founded in 1989, so it's a long running program. It's a uh, combination of quite a bit of institutions, 14 universities, institutions, and companies. There are a lot of people that work there. And right now there is a pilot plant which is running at the University of, uh, of Barcelona. Uh, it's not complete yet, and it's still quite big. It's not a space application yet. It's like one of those first computers in history. You know, it's still multiple rooms, but we're on our way. That's basically what it is. And so what happened is that now, right now I'm actually working in, t um, I have positions, because I'm not doing that full time, but I have positions in two space technology companies. One is Liquifer Systems Group. Uh, people that are in, uh, active in the field of architecture might have heard of them. They're a space architecture company. Uh, they won, they had like the third prize in the, um, there was a NASA contest on, on 3D printing Mars habitats and they had the, the third <laughs> prize there. And then there's also IP Star, which is a spin-off company of the Melissa Project. And I'm, I'm active in both companies. So I really rolled into the world of space exploration through this collaboration with ESA and then I applied for the High Seas mission. And once again, I think a lot of you will know about this, the High Seas program. Uh, in Hawaii, which is a NASA-funded Mars simulation pr uh, project. It's located in, uh, on the big island of Hawaii, on the Mauna Loa volcano, the largest volcano on Earth. It is basically a geodesic dome con connected to a sea can, to a container. Uh, the power is mostly uh, sustainable, but things like water and food are still, uh, especially the water, is still trucked in. They don't have a water purification system yet. Um, and the goal, the main goal of this particular uh, simulation program is to study the effects of long-term isolation on the psychology of crews, you know, on the functioning of crew, team dynamics. It's a little less about hardware. That's why some of the, uh, the hardware you can see is still relatively simple, uh, but it's mostly a social and psychological experiment. And uh, I was the commander of the very first high seas mission. Um, back in 2013. This is how the, um, the, the architecture looks like. It's a, an, 
an open space, mostly open space on the, on the ground floor uh, that is used either for exercise or work. In the back is the kitchen. But we do have our individual, um, our individual private spaces up there. So there's a little bit of privacy if you have your own uh, little room. Um, isolation means uh, when you get outside, there is hardly any sign of civilization. The only thing that you can see when you go out of the high seas habitat is basically the telescopes on the other volcano, uh, Mauna Kea. Uh, but apart from that, there is no sign of... Some people are like, oh, I want to do a Mars mission in Hawaii, palm trees and everything. No, 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 that's, you know, you're really remote. There is nothing to see there. Um, the, the, it is actually quite a stunning uh, uh, geology. And as you can see on the photos, it does look a lot like Mars. So, oh, and this, the, what you see here is, of course, an EVA, an extravehicular activity. Uh, we're wearing spacesuits. These are not real spacesuits. They're spacesuit simulators. And this particular uh, spacesuit simulator was developed by the University of Maryland by the Space Laboratory. So there's a lot of collaborations going on in the high seas program. So the, the first mission was back in 2013, four months, six crew members, uh, different nationalities. Right now, high seas already has accumulated 35 months of isolation with several crews. This is the, the crew that uh, I lived with, like, like we said, three men, three women. Uh, quite an interesting cultural mix. We get back to is one of the things that Mike was really uh, stressing. We were actually, um, I was, I'm from Belgium, I was also Canadian, Puerto Rican uh, American, African American, Russian American. So there was all kinds of cultural interesting, an uh, interesting mix, let's put it this way. This was, by the way, our training mission in MDRS. Many of you will recognize this. It was just a, a two-week training mission before we actually ended up doing the actual mission. Uh, our main study was a food study. We were actually um, asked to investigate, well, how to put it. Um, when we think about space food, or when you ask people their idea about space food, many people think it's about it's tubes and pills. Well, the whole idea of tubes and pills, it's a long time ago, and very quickly, um, uh, space agencies realize that astronauts do not like to eat like this. It's just not working. We're only human. And it's a minimum for you know, mental, well, uh, mental health to have kind of proper food. So currently, the food in the International Space Station is pretty good. It's you know, quite uh, intricate meals. But still, in long duration space missions, there is always the problem of menu fatigue. It's also something that has been observed in the military. Uh, that it's, it's a psychological phenomenon where you're really convinced you're not hungry while objectively your body needs food, which is not good. You don't want skinny astronauts to arrive on Mars. So the solution that the first high seas mission proposed was, what would happen if we allow astronauts to cook with shelf-stable ingredients? We just provide them with, with the ingredients, and off they go. You can improvise. And that's what we did. We, uh, for the scientific study, we had two days of astronaut food and then two days of free cooking with ingredients that we received, all shelf Stables, and I must say, like three in my crew were like genius cooks. The, the things they made was really stunning. I was not part of those three, by the way. I'm just quite mediocre in my cooking skills, but this was quite a, an interesting uh, experiment. What I did, um, I was I'm very interested in, in growing plants, but I was not really really allowed to grow vegetables because it would confound the food study. But I was allowed uh, to grow sprouts, so I. I did experiments with that, recycling uh, plastic waste and then building sprouters with that. And also did a bit of experimentation with our crew engineer, Simon Angler, on uh, remote operation of a very uh, simple uh, farm, a hydroponic farm with a robot arm and video feed. So some of the lessons learned uh, of, these of, this, of this particular mission. Uh, first of all, the importance of food competency. Um, no surprise, the meals that we made ourselves with ingredients were, of course, much more popular than the ready meals. I mean, that's not really a surprise. But the thing is, what we also noticed is um, when you're living in isolation, that's something I really experienced myself. You're really looking for novelty. That's something you're really craving because after some time, you, you really know every square inch and you really want to do new stuff. And the, little, the, the smallest new thing you can accomplish like building something or creating something is a huge joy of uh, uh, it's a huge joy, and so coming up with completely unexpected meals is really very powerful. Also, um, what we usually did we, we usually put two people together in the kitchen, and what happens when people are in the kitchen, they talk, and they talk about all kinds of stuff, not just about science, and that's really healthy for a, for a crew. Uh, and then last but not least, sharing food is such a deep human thing. 
uh, you made, f it, it's a caring aspect. There's a caring aspect, but also the feedback on something that you've made and you, you share it with the crew. So all of these things have a huge impact on the psychology of the crew. And that's one of the things that I, that I uh, took away. Uh, I'm not going to go in detail on all these things because I, I, sometimes I give specific talks about high seas, but one thing that stood out for me is that as a commander, I learned most. This was a huge lesson in leadership. Not traditional military kind of leadership, facilitating leadership. I learned a lot. And the reason I became or I was asked to be the commander was basically because of my experience with those art communities that I worked with before. And so that's, you know, kind of wraps up uh, the introduction on, on, on high seas. All of this got me really interested in the future of mankind in outer space. And that's how I entered the field of starship design and, and interstellar travel. And I was really interested in, of course, there are all these iconic examples. And I was really interested in how can we advance some of the thinking uh, within starship design. I'm definitely not claiming that I have the only single solution. That's not why I'm here. And that's not what I'm trying to convince you of. I'm just giving you a proposition which has been heavily inspired by biology. And just I want to see what you guys think of it. It's my current PhD at Delft University of Technology. And I'm basically giving you the very latest conceptual twists that we came up with in the team. It's a lot of information, probably too much. I probably have to skip a few things, but let's see how, how well we will do um, with the time. This is the team, the D-Star team, the Delft Starship uh, team that I uh, set up. It's a volunteering team. I, I just uh, set it up without any, no budget, just by myself, just how I, I'm used to do it when I build communities around projects. And very quickly, we had this bunch of really talented people with many different backgrounds uh, working, working on this. And so what I'm basically presenting today is, is a result of this group. Um, for the concept, I always start with a very particular um, aspect of uh, interstellar space. When we, think, when we look back at, for example, the development of the, of the Apollo program, the way they went to the moon is they went to the moon in incremental steps, right? They went closer and closer, always coming back, learning more about the risks and making more safeguards in the system. I mean, that's how you do it. You try to come up, you try to understand the different things that can go wrong and then you come back to Earth and you optimize your system. Uh, going to Mars in just one go would just be very crazy. Some co commercial companies would love to do that, but that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. It's better to go incremental. Now, the thing with interstellar space is that this approach is impossible. You can't just go a little interstellar, come back, fix a few things, and go back. I mean, that's just out of the question. But this is, at, this is crucial. This is really, really crucial, a crucial difference with the history of space exploration. It's a complete paradigm shift. Uncertain futures. How do we deal with uncertain futures? Uh, there are basically two approaches that are biology inspired. And the breakthrough star shot is using one of them. It's redundancy. That's when you see when fish reproduce. And they reproduce a hell of a lot of small fish. Of course, a lot of them will be eaten, but at least some of them will survive. Or flowers that produce so many seeds that are just all, they're all in the sky everywhere. Um, these are, are, this is the strategy of redundancy. And in breakthrough star shot, most of you know this project. This is the same approach, sending a large amount of small probes and hoping that at least a few of them will make it. It's a valid strategy. There's nothing wrong with it. It works perfectly fine. Now, we are using a bit of a different approach. And this has been inspired by this particular research project from a few years ago from the University of Pennsylvania. And it's called Foambot. It's quite an amazing robot. It doesn't look like it. It looks a little messy. But it's on a conceptual level, it's quite interesting. And that's what I'm always mostly interested in. It's actually a robot without a body. It's a mother sh mothership, that's how they call it. It's a kind of unit. And when you expose the unit through a particular physical challenge, it will calculate the physical body it needs to overcome the challenge. It will distribute the electronic joints on the floor according to this calculated body. And it will then connect all the joints using polyurethane foam. It builds its own body on the spot then calculates a software module to operate the body and tackles the challenge. I was blown away when I read this. I was like, this is fantastic. And this, for me, was a way out to deal with this problem of uncertain futures. Why maybe we could develop a starship that is constantly evolving and adapting according to the challenges ahead. And so that's what I've been uh, focusing on for quite some time now. And we've heard talks about it before. This is now perfectly possible with some technologies like uh, 3D printing. 
3D printing in space would allow you to constantly modify and optimize your, your, your spacecraft, basically. Now, there's one particular thing, of course, when we're talking about interstellar travel, and we're traveling, like, let's say, with a speed of light of 10%, 20% maybe. Um, what about the resources for the printing? It's not like you can just break, and look around, and grab some resources and move on again. That's not going to work. So you basically are pretty much forced to take all the resources on board at the get-go when you start with the mission, which is quite similar with what happens here uh, with an embryo, a, a, a bird embryo, which is developing inside an egg. It's the, the, the yolk slowly transforming into a very complex system. And that's a bit how I look, like, look at uh, potential starship design. So this is the conceptual diagram that I'm proposing or that we're working on. Our concept of a spaceship it has these two distinct components. There is this active component, which is much more related to traditional space, uh, spacecraft design, and there is crucially a passive component of raw, com raw com uh, passive component with raw materials. And that enables you to continuously bootstrap growth and evolution during the journey. So it's a little bit of a slightly different look at space systems. And what better resource to use than asteroids? So we're, yes, we're talking about asteroid starships. So that's what we are uh, actually developing now. So we're developing concepts for evolving asteroid starships. There's an interesting history to uh, asteroid starships. Uh, the earliest, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but these are the, among the earliest examples that I found of concepts where uh, writers and, and, and researchers came up with the idea of using an asteroid as a vessel. On one hand, we have uh, Dandridge Cole, uh, in the 60s, who was a space engineer who came up with interesting concepts. And of course, in science fiction, I think Larry Niven is, is, is one of the uh, famous examples. So how do we approach this? How do we approach our growing starship and our evolving starship? One thing we, uh, we embraced is the concept of modularity. Because how on earth are you going to evolve a particular design shape? If we look at a lot of the starships, for example, in, in science fiction, how would you evolve that? Yeah, you can use CGI, but let's look at reality. How would you do that? And then modularity is a really interesting way to, to, to create a possibility to move things around. So we defined a whole range of modules with different particular functions. As you can see, there's, the important ones are definitely biological life support and habitation. But there also, there's also shielding, there's mining, processing, so different types of modules that are put together to create a starship. And so the mining procedure that we're having in mind is, first of all, we're developing, let me see, yeah. We're developing this. If, if this is the asteroid, it's a very simple diagram. We're developing the asteroid in a cone behind the asteroid, like a, a safe, an area which is safe. It's like a, a shadow which is safe for impact behind the asteroid. Because the asteroid is not only used for resources, it also doubles up as a shield, a front shield for the trip. Uh, you first start out with uh, developing the, uh, the starship in a smaller cone, and then gradually you maximize until you, know, you, you potentially reach the full size. Now, the mining, um, we are actually actively mining and then using the resources to print. We're actually mining on the surface of the asteroid and slowly finding our way inside the asteroid. So the mining happens inside the asteroid, and then the, the, next, the next mining module will be a little deeper. So the whole structure, the whole system is gradually burrowing itself inside the asteroid. But at the same time, the, the components are used to build infrastructure outside. So it's basically going in two directions. It's going inside and outside. In literature, you find uh, often either one of the two. It's either something inside an asteroid or something that's connected to an asteroid. And we're doing a bit of a, a hybrid approach. And the way we, want, we think we can, uh, do, we can, we can mine the, the geometry of an asteroid is by first mining the half, half of the asteroid and then in a last stage uh, hollow it out and then we would retain the rest for structural integrity. So that's kind of the, the, the way we would do the mining. This is a, a render that was created. Um, we're using a particular, and I haven't talked about this yet, we're actually using a, a particular morphology. This is a truncated octahedron. It's a very beautiful shape. I love it. Uh, the interesting thing is that, first of all, you can stack them uh, without losing any space. They perfectly fit together. Uh, and secondly, what is interesting about this from an architectural point of view is that they have multiple, they have so many sides. So you can connect one space with so many other spaces. So it will, would be, it, it's really easy, it's really interesting from a, um, a, a, a perspective of connecting, of connecting all the different spaces, basically. 
And so what you see here is just a, it's a bit of an artist impression. We're still working on it. But it's a structure that is actually, it's partly inside the asteroid, which of course you can't see. And then you have all these modules uh, gradually coming out. We're also interested in a bit of um, an organic growth of this. We're not using a top-down plant. There is a lot of bottom-up growth happening here. So that's why it has this kind of um, organic look. It looks very different than a, a really nicely, typically a designed starship, as you know it from a lot of science fiction representations. For the printing, uh, we're also working on, on concepts for uh, 3D printing. What you can see here is a biomorphic printer. It uses very, it's, it's a bit inspired by soft robotics. It has these very flexible, flexible feet. Um, and then there is a kind of umbilical cord which is connected to a module that provides it with uh, the material to print. And then it could, for example, first print a frame and then start filling, filling out the frame. Now, what I've been talking about up to this small point is basically using an asteroid to build growing architecture, 3D printing architecture. Now, the other thing that we're adding to our model is a regenerative ecosystem. We're actually modeling both. And the idea is that the resources are not just used to 3D print growing architecture, but are also used to sustain a growing ecosystem. And it's basically the ecosystem that gives the signals to the architecture to expand. The architecture is not just not growing for the sake of growing. I mean, there's no point, right? So as soon as the ecosystem is expanding, including the human population, this will give signals to the architecture like, hey, we need more space. And then the architecture will increase. Now, and this is, this is something that I find particularly interesting is that for the regenerative ecosystem, we're actually using that MELISA system that I talked about. So we're actually using the concept from the European Space Agency for future ecosystems in our starship modeling. And they're very excited about this, and they've been very helpful. Uh, and so in order for you to explain this a little more in detail, uh, I'm going to go through the different steps of this regenerative ecosystem. I hope you can bear with me. I think it's super interesting. I'm a biologist, but let's see. Um, Oh, I will, I will explain this a little later. I'm a little too, too soon. So, so far I've talked about growth, right? Resources from the asteroids, you grow your ecosystem, you grow your architecture. Now, there is, remember, in the beginning of my talk, I talked about uncertain futures. There's a lot of uncertainty there. Radiation can happen at certain moments that you did not anticipate. Particle impacts can happen that you did not anticipate. And so this is where evolution comes in. And I really distinguish very clearly between growth and evolution. I mean, it seems very obvious, but I want to stress this. What I talked about so far is pretty much crystalline growth. You have a particular structure, and slowly over time, the crystal just repeats its own structure, and it kind of grows and it gets bigger. Evolution is really a radical transformation of a morphology of something. It's a whole different thing. It can also have new functionality, of course, but it's mostly like a reshuffling of a body plan. And that's what, is, what could be useful to deal with uncertain futures. So what basically we're, we're doing is, um, because, of, whoops, because of the modularity, let me see if I can get back here. Because of the modularity, I talked about this before, because of the modularity of the starship, you can easily shift things around. You can rebuild the entire body of the starship. So that's a bit the goal. And conceptually, this is how it works. We do build in a sensing horizon, concepts coming from robotics. So the starship does have an idea of what's coming up to a certain extent. If what's coming up is very similar, the starship will continue to grow. If what's coming up is very different, is, is, very, is changing, then evolution will be, will, start, will be started to optimize the system for the upcoming challenges. That's really a key concept here. So the simulation we're building is, is, uh, is, it is a bit of a summary of the simulation that we're building. On one hand, we're building a simulation. It's, I think you, you guys can't really read it. It's way sharper on my laptop. Uh, <laughs> I can hardly read it myself. But anyhow, um, we're building a simulation in which we're simulating many different processes simultaneously. We're doing the asteroid mining, the ore processing, the 3D printing, the growth of the ecosystem, and the impact of the interstellar medium. They are all simulated in one simulation, right? As soon as evolution is needed because a different environment is coming up, we use genetic algorithms to rebuild the system, to rebuild the starship. But we're actually, first, first before we start actually rebuilding the starship, we're running a, sim, we're running a simulation 
in the simulation. We're doing nested simulation. So within the simulation, the Starship is first trying to figure out which optimal configuration would work the best, and then it will rebuild itself. So that's basically uh, what this diagram is saying. So let me move over to the, the modeling results. There are two parts. First part is, it's, I mean, we haven't, we're still building this, we're still building the code, but we already have some conceptual results there. The first part is gonna be about the ecosystem. The second thing is gonna be about the architecture and the 3D printing and asteroid mining. Um, here I am with the Melissa loop, and this is the place where I'm gonna, this is the moment where I'm gonna try and explain some of the aspects of the Melissa loop. There is a first compartment, which is here. You can see it here. And once again, you can't really read it, but I'll try to explain as, as best as I can. The first compartment in the Melissa system is a, bac is a bioreactor, bacteria, and it receives waste from the uh, human compartment, toilet waste, basically. And it also it receives non-edible plant material. Those get fermented. So basically, the very first compartment in this ecosystem is fermentation. It breaks down uh, those materials uh, in, in, in this bioreactor. And what comes out of fermentation? If you think about beer, first one is CO2. So the CO2 is taken out. And otherwise, what comes out is three components, volatile fatty acids, minerals, and ammonium. And that's it. So that's the first stage, pretty simple, bioreactor, you ferment your waste and you get CO2 out and a few other things, right? The next stage is, is this one. And that's an interesting organism. It's uh, another bioreactor with a different bacteria. It's not fermentation. It's called Rhodospirillum. And it's um, a microorganism, it's red, but it, it uses, photos, it, it uses an, a light energy. It uses, you, you need to illuminate it, basically. And what it does is, it is really good at breaking down volatile fatty acids. That's the only function of this organism in the system. It breaks down volatile fatty acids. Once again, CO2 is produced, which goes to the plants. And the thing is that the, the carbon of the volatile fatty acids are basically gets incorporated in the body of the microorganisms. And that's quite interesting. This is a volatile fatty acid, for example. And the structure of a volatile fatty acid, you can see two oxygen atoms here, and it's a carbon atom. So basically what happens when this organism um, is breaking down this, it basically cuts off the head, and it, that's the CO2, C and two O's. And then all the rest is incorporated in the body of the microorganism, and you can eat them. Rhodospirillum is an edible component in the system. So basically the carbon ends up back in the body of the astronaut, while it actually came from the waste. So that's, the, that's what it does. The next stage, remember, we also had ammonium. We still have that ammonium, and ammonium is not a good thing to have in an ecosystem, but you can give it to nitrifying bacteria that combine ammonium with oxygen and turn it into nitrates. And then the nitrates go to the next stage, and there's the plant compartment, and so the plant compartment receives a lot of those input outputs from those previous uh, bioreactors, CO2, nitrates, and then the plants provide oxygen and food for the astronauts, and that's basically closing the circle. All right, I hope this is, this is kind of clear. I think it's a really elegant way of doing it. It's not the only way of doing it because there's always discussions about which kind of ecosystem, but I think this is definitely an elegant solution. Um, and it is inspired by nature because the whole process that I just explained to you is constantly happening in rivers and streams with the same types of micro or similar microorganisms. So it's, it's a really natural uh, system. So. Now, the modeling part, if you want to model something like this, it's a bit of a challenge. The first thing you need to do is you need to make sure that your stoichiometry, stoichiometry is, is correct. What does that mean? Um, for example, this is the, the chemical reactions from compartment one. You get proteins and polysaccharides that are entering compartment one, and they're breaking, broken down into volatile fatty acids. The thing is, I'm not gonna go in detail in all the, you know, explaining all the, the specifics here, but the crucial thing to remember here is what goes in needs to go out. So you need to figure out, you need to make sure that all the atoms on the left side of the equation are the same number as the atoms on the right side of the equation. So that's the first thing. So the first thing you do is you select which chemical reactions you're gonna uh, use in your model. There are many, many chemical reactions happening in an ecosystem. You need to fo focus on a few, one of them. And then once you selected those few, you need to make sure that all the atoms are accounted for. That takes a little bit of effort, but can be done. And then we use this. This is agent-based modeling. 
It's a very particular way of modeling. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with agent-based modeling. Um, it's, not like a, it's not like a regular mathematical equation. It's a different way of looking at things. It's very popular with sociologists and biologists. And why? The thing is, with agent-based modeling, you're basically uh, using individual agents that are representing uh, an, an item in reality. It's called ontological correspondence. For example, you can create an agent which is an astronaut. It's an artificial agent. It represents an astronaut. And the interesting thing is that the agent can receive something and can send out something, just like in the compartments in the Melissa system. It's basically that, right? And what's even more interesting is that you can actually tweak the behavior of the agents. So what you can do is you can create a system. It's a bit like a swarm of birds. Swarm of birds, nobody designs a swarm of birds. That's not how it works. You take agents like, you know, you can actually, in this program, you can perfectly simulate a swarm of birds. You take agents, you give them a few basic rules because a swarm of birds emerges out of agents interacting with just a few simple rules. And that's what happens here. You define your agents, their behavior, what needs to be transmitted to the next stage, and then, uh, how to put it, the dynamics emerge out of that. And that's something you cannot just do you know, with, with other means. It's a very different way it's, uh, of looking at systems, specifically at ecosystems, because you're defining the rules of the game, you're defining who is playing the game, you're taking a step back, and then the whole system emerges. And the system emerges uh, through this. So what you will see is, on one hand, in your interface, you will see the number of agents. If populations are growing, you will see more agents popping up. It gives you an idea of the size of the populations, which is very important for our starship simulation. And on the other hand, what you see here, without going into too much detail, is the concentrations of the different chemicals. Could be oxygen, could be nitrates, all those chemicals. So that's what you see when you start running that simulation. You get an idea about the population sizes, and you get an idea about the chemical concentrations. Now, when you're defining agents, there is, it's quite intricate. And that's, you know, that's one of the things I definitely wanted to share with you today. It's a little, I hope you will stay with me. For example, here is an example of how you have to conceptualize a plant agent, or how we did it. It's not like you have to do it, but that's how we did it. A tick is basically like a ticking clock. So agent-based modeling works with ticks. So every tick, something happens, and then it moves on. And so what you see here, for example, this is the, the input. These are the nutrients, for example. They're abstract nutrients. You have a seed. So in tick one, the seed gets some nutrients. And at the end of the tick, it's a full-grown plant. The next tick, it gets nutrients. It's still a full-grown plant. goes on. And after a number of, of nutritions, it, becomes, it gets into the state where it's to be harvested. Right? So these are the states. And this is the time arrow. Right? It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. That's the, the behavior you're defining. You can also do this. What happens if at a certain moment there is not enough nutrients? We put the plant at risk. But if then it gets nutrients again, it's growing again. All this needs to be defined. You know, this, the model is not figuring it out by itself. You need to define this. And then the last uh, kind, of, uh, uh, I, uh, the kind of situation that we uh, programmed is this one, where indeed there is no food. But if there is twice no food, the plant dies and needs to be seeded again and goes on. And you can already sense that by embedding these kind of scenarios in your model, you will have a beautiful kind of biological um, dynamic that comes out of that, which is much more sophisticated than, for example, just a, a, a mathematical equation. Nothing against simple mathematical equations, but this is a, a different story. This is how we conceptualize the growth of bioreactors. I'm, I don't have enough time to go in. It's a really nice diagram. And we can sit down later, and I can explain all of you just a few things to remember here. Um, a bioreactor, whoops, a bioreactor is something very different than a plot of plants. Uh, a bioreactor, if you give it um, not enough food, it won't die. It will, the, the density of the organism will just go down. And that's basically what we're trying to do here. Also, and that's an interesting aspect of the modeling that we're doing, we're talking about organisms that need more than one molecule. It's not like they use one molecule and they transform it into something else. They often need two molecules. Now, it's the one with the lowest concentration that will determine how much of the output product is being produced. And the rest, if there is, for example, product A and product B, and you have a lot of product B and only a little bit of A, well, A will determine how much of the new product you can make, and there will be a lot of surplus of product B. So in your model, you need to keep constantly track how much remains in each bioreactor. And that also changes the dynamics of the population. So it's really pretty uh, intricate. 
And that's what this, uh, what this is showing. So the other kind of uh, modeling that we're building, because we're building two models and then the goal is to connect both models, is the asteroid mining and architectural growth. For the um, asteroid mining, we're basically uh, using a C-type asteroid. I think some, some of you might know a lot about this, so I would love to go into conversation with you about this. Um, we are really interested in, in, in this because of the presence of oxygen, but also carbon. Uh, the graph here is basically showing uh, the elements distribution in a, in a typical carbonaceous uh, asteroid. We are also assuming a uniform distribution of elements throughout the asteroid. Now, we're not talking about concentrations of this material in this, in this location of the asteroid. That would make things a little too complicated. Um, the requirements for the architectural growth are the following. It needs to be dynamic. It's not growing when it doesn't need to grow, but it grows when it gets, gets these signals from the ecosystem. So it's connected to population growth. Also, um, when something is being printed, when architecture is being printed, you need to be really careful what you're printing. You can't just keep printing habitation modules and forgetting about the biological life support modules because you'll have people that have no life support. They will die. They will die. So there's a whole range of, of rules there what needs to be printed first. And then last but not least, also you want to print in a protective configuration. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. These are all the constraints that we could come up with when we're talking about architectural growth in the concept we're presenting. The ship is traveling and at a certain point it knows I need to print new architecture, right? These are the constraints. Briefly, there's only so much time, so we really pressed for time. Um, there's only so many materials available. The asteroid only has these materials. You have speeds of mining, processing of 3D printing that will all limit what you can actually achieve. Uh, oh, I see this twice here. Um, you also, once again, you need to figure out which module you need, and you need to be careful about radiation and wearing of existing modules. So all of that needs to be taken into account before you can make a decision. The programmer that I'm working with, Andreas, is building a, a code which incorporates all of this. So it's called a multi-dimensional solution space. The, the, the solution is taking into account all these different factors. Pretty, pretty complex. This is an interesting solution that we found uh, to, take, um, to make sure that we can always print something. And that's something that actually Andreas came up with and I thought it was really wonderful. We're not going to print our architecture out of one material. We're going to print the architecture out, out of different materials. So the Starship architecture might geometrically look the same. All the modules might look the same. But one module might be built out of a different material than another one, uh, depending on the availability of materials. And that's what you can see here. Um, if, um, depending on the type of material you print with, you might need more or less. Some materials are really good shielding, so you don't need much of them. Other ones are not so good in shielding, so you need much more of them. So for example, if you need from material one this level and from material two this level to print something, you can see that at time two, you have enough of uh, material one, so you can use it to print. And in time three, you don't have enough of material one, but you have enough of material two, so you can use that to print. So it's differentiated 3D printing that we're actually uh, using. Now, the interstellar medium, we make a few assumptions here. I think the main assumption that we're making here is that we use an average mass of 1.25 um, atomic mass uh, units. Uh, it's based on the fact that most particles, and once again, correct me if I'm wrong, most particles in the interstellar medium have this lower mass, and that kind of skews it to this, uh, to this mass. Um, the calculating the impact, I'm trying to go a little faster. Um, so for calculating the impact, we're using a uniform particle distribution. So once again, no concentrated clouds or anything. And we're, that's for the impact calculations. And then we are also uh, calculating, whoops, we're also calculating radiation. And for radiation, um, we're using a pretty intricate um, simulation in which we're calculating how much of the radiation actually penetrates the inside of the module. And it's interesting when you compare a module without anything around it and you calculate how much of the radiation gets inside. Um, that's quite a lot. It would cause uh, radiation sickness uh, syndrome here. This one, this particular module built out of uh, aluminum. Uh, half a meter thickness, but once the module is surrounded by other modules, that changes the ballgame. And so the simulation, when it's calculating the ecology inside the uh, Starship, it's not only using the agent-based modeling, but it's also using the information about radiation to modify 
further the growth and uh, the health of the ecosystem. So that adds another layer. And this brings me basically to, to the conclusion of my, my talk. So this is kind of the main things that I've tried to explain. I know it's quite a lot of information, but I hope you, you get the main points. First of all, we developed an asteroid starship that both grows and evolves. It contains subsurface and protruding architecture, so it's really a combination of the two. We use an existing regenerative ecosystem concept, the MELISSA system from European Space Agency. We use asteroid mining and, very important, differential additive manufacturing, depending on what's available, different materials are used to print. There is a dynamic bottom-up growth of both the Starship ecosystem and the architecture. They're both connected. And last but not least, there is a discrete evolution of the Starship architecture through modular reconfiguration. It's really important. The evolution is happening through reshuffling the modules, but of course, because of that, it is discrete. And this is the next steps that we want to do. Uh, we want to connect both models, the ecosystem model and then the architecture 3D printing model. We want to start exploring genetic algorithms. It's conceptually there, but we haven't implemented it yet. Uh, and then the last thing that I want to highlight is we're building our own Beowulf cluster, so our own little supercomputer, uh, to run the simulations out of um, uh, Raspberry Pis, which is uh, a kind of art design science project that we're building. Uh, and I will add an interesting component to the project, I think. And this basically concludes my talk. Thank you. <laughs>
could be implemented. Mm -hmm. um, but how are you guys dealing with the with four organisms that that necessarily may uh, may um, be dependent upon gravity? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. We've been thinking about this as well because we're, like I said, we're really interested. The first step we're taking now is a very conceptual step. So a lot of these very concrete things like leaking and and and. Uh, uh, of gassing and, and, and gravity are still a little bit up in the air. Um, nevertheless, we've been thinking about this and uh, we believe that a lot of the bioreactors would work in zero gravity, that would not be a problem. And we're now working with a designer on designing centrifuges that would be used to grow the, uh, the higher plants and to see how they would fit in one of those modules. So, so we, are, we are trying to, uh, to work with that. Humans would, at this point, not really have gravity. I mean, we, we came up with all kinds of ideas, maybe installing a ring around this growing starship and that would, could be temporarily used. I mean, there's all kinds, but these are very uh, specific design uh, choices that, at this point, I think we're still a little too conceptual to already make the jump to that kind of detail. But they're definitely valid and interesting yeah. questions. It's, it's, I don't want to dismiss it. I'm assuming that we'll figure out uh, countermeasures, you know, for that. You know, that's one of the things that is also you've seen is not present in the model is propulsion, and that's very deliberate. You know, we're not talking about propulsion; we're really talking about adaptability on a conceptual level. But um, yeah, of course, all these things. But like I, s I hope you get you understand it's already very layered, and at a certain point, you just have to stop adding more complexity because you just nobody gets it anymore. But these are interesting. I'm hoping that we can develop this as a first model, and then I can finish my PhD with this, and then afterwards we can keep on expanding modules, and we can add modules to that and expand it slowly but surely. Most of the projects that I've presented, pretty much all of them are open source. So you know that's that's the nature of the projects. They evolve themselves. It's in a very meta. Thank you. I'm interested in the differential 3D printing, mm -hmm. and have you experimented with uh, materials? Yeah, not, not yet. We, um, we did some research, and uh, the kind of example that we used to, to make this clear to people is like, you could, you could use carbon, uh, aluminum, or copper foam, for example, and these are three materials you could build architectures with, with specific properties in regard, with regards to radiation resistance and, and wear by particle collision. And you can do all the math and then see, you know, how much thickness you need and how much, when the materials are available to build your module. So, but we haven't practically experimented with, with it yet. I mean, these are all wonderful ideas to, to work on for sure. Yeah. I'm actually hoping to, to move, but it's also after I finish this study, to do experiments with 3D printing. Of course, not build a, a spaceship, but actually uh, inspired by these concepts, something evolvable like a little unit that actually is exposed to a challenge and then evolves itself. I would love to do that, but that's, gonna, that's another, research, another research project. Yeah. Uh, have you any and col uh, collaboration with um, Biosphere 2 or Biosphere 1 project? Um, I've met one of the people from Biosphere 2. What's his name again? He was in Hawaii as well. I forgot his name. But uh, apart from having a conversation, uh, and I, I haven't even been there yet, uh, the interesting thing about Biosphere 2 is I always use it as the polar opposite of the Melissa approach. Um, trying not to be too judgmental about it, but I'm an ecologist, so I have my ideas about what went wrong in Biosphere 2. But uh, the interesting thing about Biosphere 2, I think, is that it was set up by people with a theater background. Most of those people came from the theater and performing arts. And they looked, and you can really feel it in the ideology that they used to design uh, their system is, um, there's an English word for it, which I forget. Um, they looked at it from a very visual, performative point of view. The ecosystem became first and foremost a visual backdrop that reminded us of where we came from. Right? That was the, you can read it in all the articles about it. That's really crucial. Uh, the problem is that from an ecological perspective, this does not work. Uh, the best example is the mini ocean. If you tell any ecologist you're going to build a mini ocean in an oversized pool, they'll be like, what? Mini ocean? 
it's never going to behave like an ocean, not even close. You know, this is complete. It might look like it on a photo, but it's never going to work like this. And so Melissa is taking the other approach, which is like basically at this point forgetting about the aesthetics, forgetting about the performativity, and only looking at what an ecosystem needs to do in order to keep people alive. And I, of course, I'm interested in, in, in something that looks a little nicer than the Melissa system at this point because it looks like a lab. Um, but we need to first and foremost focus on the functionality and understanding that and modeling that and controlling it. And then you can add that other layer. And they just, and I think that's where it crucially went wrong. Oh, um, I have, do you, are you familiar with the work of uh, Rachel Armstrong? I work with Rachel. Okay, yeah, all we right. The I'm world ship, with, and with there seems own. like a real correlation. Yeah, yeah, we, we work together. I mean, she, um, she's doing a project now on living architecture with bioreactors, and I'm one of the researchers. Okay, the all right. Hi, thanks Hello. so much for your talk. And uh, uh, by the way, I was the support part of the uh, high sea support mission on your first mission, so it's wonderful to meet we you in person. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <Holy> <laughs> So my question is, um, so have you heard about the spitting rocks bacteria? Um, I've heard about it, so I don't know if you have heard about it, you know, Excuse where these me, bacteria which? are able to uh, spit out this uh, nutrient and then it can solidify and become rock. Oh, really? No, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't heard about it, but oh, there's okay. so, so much to choose from. <laughs> uh, the thing is, with the, the choice of bacteria, at this point, European Space Agency is not uh, is trying to hold off from synthetic biology because of public backlash or fear of public backlash. Uh, but I do believe that in the future, this will be part of those ecosystems. They will be genetically, and then they might have these properties that could be used for other purposes than just recycling uh, uh, waste and, and maybe producing building components, for example. But that's, you know, Rachel is also working on that for many years. Uh, Mauna Kea is 14,000 feet high. How, how far up did you build your structure? The structure we live in is a, a little over uh, four, between four and 5,000 feet. Okay, so, so the, the habitat. about what an airplane cabin is pressurized at, right? So it's, I think so, yeah. yeah okay, yeah, I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah. All right, can we get a hand for Angela Vermeulen? Yeah.